Good afternoon, and welcome to the conference's last panel. It's hard to believe, but we've gotten to this point after three really, really productive and exciting days, and I hope um, we will close this year's conference in the most productive and engaging and thought-provoking manner. Um, it is, this is a very complex subject matter. Over the last couple of days, I have had an opportunity to discuss some ideas and bounce some ideas with you around breakfast. And um, what became evident to me um, was the fact that we throw terms around easily without thinking about them more deeply. And when you start discussing them in a deeper way, you realize that the way we use them um, leads us to a lot of misunderstandings. I know that we have about an hour, which is not a lot of time, but what I would like to try to do with you today is just try, if it's possible, not only to raise questions, again, I don't think we can provide answers today, but also perhaps create some clarity when it comes to some of these terms. So, um, when I started thinking about this panel, the first thing that uh, jumped to my mind, to my attention, was what do we really mean when we talk about public ethics? And when you use the term public, obviously you're creating immediately a binary condition because you begin to look at this in contrast to private ethics. And I would like to start this conversation by asking each one of you to perhaps spend a few minutes to talk about this very thing. What do we mean by the term public ethics today? You are bioethicist, you are a physician, a researcher who has spent a lot of time contemplating the um, notion of ethics uh, within the medical profession, within the hospital environment. And so I would like to provide you an opportunity to talk about this, this very concept of public ethics, because we're talking about public places, and I would like also to make the distinction that was brought up to my attention. It's not about spaces, because space is about a physical environment, it's about place, it's about communities, it's about bringing people together. So, Barry, public ethics, the way you understand it. Sure, uh, and uh, let me uh, say how delighted I am to be on this panel with these very distinguished bioethicists. Uh, for, as a physician, I think that we differentiate private physicians' feelings about things from their professional ethics. And that, of course, goes back to the Hippocratic Oath, which really sets very, very high standards for physicians and really, I think, separates what the individual might feel from a personal standpoint from what their obligations are as a physician and the responsibility they have. <clears throat> I always stress for uh, my students that the uh, that they'll get their diploma from the school, uh, which, depending upon in the United States, could be only 50 years old. Uh, they'll get their license to practice medicine when they uh, get certified by the state in which they're practicing, and those states were a couple of hundred years old, but that they enter the profession by professing that oath. And they take that oath with every person in the world in a bilateral relationship. And by that, I mean how important it is that by taking that oath, they understand that if the state tells them to do something that violates that oath, then they have to, in fact, resist that. Uh, that their responsibility now by entering into the healing professions is, in fact, that public responsibility. So we make a very clear distinction between private and public when it comes to the medical profession. 
Thank you. Before I turn on to you, Ruth, I just wanted to say that um, feel free to engage each other as each one of you uh, begins to respond to these questions because this is a conversation and again to remind the audience that we would like you to engage with us as we are up here uh, through sending us questions. We welcome that very much. We don't want this to be just a monologue, us talking to you, but we want you to talk to us as well and engage into a conversation. Thank you. Ruth. Thank you for this opportunity, Stelios. I appreciate it. So let me take a slightly different cut than Barry has taken and uh, step back and use a, a kind of tripartite distinction. So first we could talk about private ethics, and that would be the, um, the ethics of how we conduct ourselves in our interpersonal and intimate lives. So with our friends, with our families, with the people who are in our uh, most immediate circle. And there are many, many questions about the kinds of actions we should or shouldn't take, the kinds of character traits we should develop and express in our relationships with one another in, let's call it, intimate or interpersonal circles. Then there's the next level, which is where Barry was, I think, going, which is your role responsibility or your obligations in whatever profession or craft uh, or um, the line of, of work you might have. And there, uh, there's a connection that goes to the interpersonal and it goes to the public. So if you're a physician or an accountant or you're a, 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 a receptionist or you're a bricklayer, you have certain responsibilities, some of which are ethical, that are specific to your craft, specific to your profession. And then there's public ethics. And these, this has both an individual and an institutional level. So public ethics concerns the rules and the norms that we establish for how we interact with each other in a political and social environment. So it's much bigger than our interpersonal world. It's bigger still, even, than our limited but terribly important professional identities. As individuals, it's much of what we talked about yesterday. It's our role as, as civic participants in a social and cultural and political community. And that can be at the level of the local community, that can be your national environment, but it also has to do with your role as global citizens, as we spoke about yesterday. It also has to do with the roles and the norms of the institutions we set up, so government, civil society, the private sector, and finally, last piece, some of us have roles that are specifically public. So if you are a public official in government, <coughs> or you're a front-facing uh, member of the civil society, your role obligations are, in fact, in the public arena. So it's public ethics for a certain kind of role. So let me, let me pick up on that. I like that, Ruth, the, the tripartite. That's good. It's not like we could do the screaming man thing and yeah, go back no, and forth. That'd be a little easier. But maybe we can do that at the end. At the end. Wait, wait, it's <laughs> coming. It's with, coming. With different philosophers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the tripartite distinction works well, and I would add to it. I think the public ethics space is, a, is to think of it even more generally is what ought that space be like and how ought we behave? So the ethical question comes to what the ought is. And that ought is both process and outcome. So part of it is fair engagement, fair deliberation, how we treat one another um, in our daily lives and in decision making. But the other piece is the patterns that we create by the actions we take. So there's an ought to make the world a better place. If there are deep injustices, if there's unfairness, then I think we need to add both the process and the outcome measure. And that probably holds at each of the levels, but I just I don't want to go on too long. Maybe I'll, I'll try to build on that. Um, I think the, this tripartite notion is important, um, but the distinctions between public and, and private have, have blurred, maybe to the point of being um, not so meaningful any longer. So um, think about the, the way in which our information about the people in, in our lives and about whom we pay attention and maybe care as leaders uh, are open to us in ways that have really not been true in the past. And so their, their private lives are very much public. And so the, the notion about their public roles being somehow distinct from their private actions um, seems to have gone missing. Uh, maybe it's, it's a sort of casualty of, of social media. So to, to, make, to be a little um, concrete about it, uh, 
we can think of, and people do talk about Twitter as the public square. That, that is public speech in a very real way. Um, we were saying when we were talking about this panel the other day, people who think about their um, private actions being only private sometimes find that that isn't the case. There's a, a recent example in the United States of um, some um, applicants to Harvard University who had been accepted. They thought that they were interacting on a private Facebook page which was uh, open to the administrators of the university and their offers to matriculate at the university were revoked. So their, what they thought was private behavior actually was deemed public and they were punished for that. The last thing I would say maybe to, to set up the next round of questions, Stelios, is I think it's, it's really important when we talk about the roles of our um, civic leaders to, to think about the idea of, of authority, um, moral authority in particular, and a distinction which um, we, we, I think, find compelling at the moment between formal authority, where people can seize or uh, win formal authority but lack moral authority. That is the notion that they are committed to the interests of the uh, country or the, uh, the, the city, the locality that they govern in a way that's bigger than their commitment to themselves. And I think that's a very important um, point to capture in the course of this conversation. Thank you. Um, now that we have established some sense between the difference between public and private ethics, I wanted to go back to yesterday's performance of Antigone, which is, to my mind at least, about contested ethics in different spaces. On one hand, you have the law of nature, divine law, and on the other hand, you have the law of the state that necessitate different ethical approaches. So, as individuals, we find ourselves on a regular basis uh, moving between different places, there are public places, essentially, that negotiate, necessitate different ethical approaches. So, let's say that um, one place that we find ourselves sometimes within a religious context that has a particular ethical approach to particular issues. And then let's say that we find ourselves, and I bring something familiar to you, within a hospital environment where different ethical questions come into place. Some of them contradict the ones that you have to live by uh, within your role, within your place, uh, within a religious community. How does an individual today go about negotiating um, these differences? And what is the ethical approach at the end that has to come on the top? And I can start with Bart, perhaps. Um, I think that in, at least in the, the medical community, the issue of uh, personal feelings based on religious convictions, uh, we've sort of worked through that there are ethical obligations related to being a professional that are the, the basis of your behavior, even if you hold personal views different from that. Uh, how you go about actualizing that is that can be meant in many ways. One can avoid being put in a position where your professional responsibilities will conflict with your personal values. Uh, but I think that ultimately that tension has to be worked out with the obligation to your professional role. Um, and I think that many people have tried to do that also at the political level. I, I remember uh, uh, political leaders who held certain religious views often had to present to the public the fact that even though they held personal religious views that their position was going to be one in which they would uphold the law of the land. And when there was a conflict between those two, the law of the land was going to be the, the deciding factor. So I think that there's tension there, uh, but I think there are mechanisms to minimize the tension and to ensure the, uh, the integrity of the, the public space. Before you go on, Ruth, I just wanted to mention something. 
if you saw, um, I've seen a number of performances of Antigone and I've followed theater of war around the country and seen a number of them, and it seems to me that in most of the cases, uh, people um, emotionally take the side of Antigone. And I've seen Brian Doris trying to get the crowd to consider the side of Creon, the law of the land. Mm -hmm. And all of the times, all of the times without failing, people do not even want to get close to that, do not even want to consider the possibility that the law of the land prevails. So can you consider this in your response? I can't, and actually I was thinking just about that, Stelios. I'm also thinking about ways to be entertaining, and I'm not coming up with any, so I'm going to rely on We need uh, the screaming we, choir, we, but... We, we need the screaming choir, we need, <clears throat> we need Antigone and, Fer and Ferguson behind us. So one of the reasons I think that Theatre of War has had trouble getting um, audience members to appreciate Creon side can be connected up to Jeff's point about moral authority. Creon is an arbitrary and unjust ruler. Right? He's presented as a, a vengeful, and, 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 and the story about Creon, right? It, he's, not, he's not an admirable ruler. And so uh, it's, it's hard to recognize the moral authority of the state when the representation is through a ruler who's perceived as not worthy of, of moral respect. There is a tension between personal private morality and the morality of the state. If you had, we, ha we have to have rules for how we work together in collectives. If we all operated according to our individual conscience in all cases, right, we would have chaos effectively, unless all of us had essentially uh, consciences who synced up in the way in which Uri was showing us brains that sync up. So there needs to be a normative order and ought for how we conduct ourselves as uh, collectives, as communities, that somehow balances that line between uh, diversity in personal conscience, whether that comes from a, a religious uh, source or some other source, and the rules of the game that are agreed to by uh, the polity, right, if you like. And generally, these are represented in constitutions and expressed through courts, and presumably exercised through uh, elected or, um, or otherwise appropriately appointed leaders who do express the kind of moral authority that allows us to accept that sometimes the way we think ought to happen, it's not going to be possible. Jim? Yeah, I'm trying to ground this in, in something that can give us an example or two to yeah. play with um, in addition to the really sort of perennially important issue of Antigone. So I want to try to tie Barry into this as well. He articulated that there are these views of things that doctors ought to do and how the laws of the state play out. And in a lot of cases, we, we make an argument that the laws of the state are unjust or unfair, and that's why our personal actions and our personal convictions are so powerful. So that's the, the, the why, the, the powerful message of Antigone, or one of them, is that this idea is that this fidelity to religious beliefs about what the gods would do with this atrocious case, whether it be in, a, in the time of Antigone or whether it's in Ferguson, it gives us some appeal. So let's take it and see, see if there's something the other way around um, where we can take a different, slightly different situation in which the law provides a protection for people's individual beliefs to play out. And one that comes to mind is a paradigmatic case that we use in teaching medical students about um, patients' ability to accept or reject any medical treatment. And in most Western societies, at least, we, we are based on this idea of liberty that we tend to be left alone. Um, we should be left alone to, to articulate and make choices on our own. Uh, when you go to a doctor, you sign a consent document to have surgery done and the like, and that comes from this very deep notion that we should be left alone. And our laws in many nations say that you can't do something to someone else, unless they've given their permission or if they're harming someone else, right? So that's a central way of playing out. The paradigmatic case that we use in medicine is uh, the case of a, a Jehovah's Witness, an adult Jehovah's Witness, whose religious belief system says that if they accept a blood transfusion, that they are eternally 
not uh, entered into the kingdom of the elect. It's not really your, it's damned, it's the hell equivalent. You don't get to heaven. And so here's a situation in which someone who is sick could be saved by the doctor whose obligation is to help and at least not harm. So that's the obligation. So I've got the ability with a blood transfusion to save this person's life. But the person says to me, you know, doctor, that's well and good. I understand what your job is, but personally, this is my religious faith, and I don't want you to intervene. I have the tools to save the person. I've taken a Hippocratic oath or something similar that says, I'll help and at least not harm. My religious belief system would be consonant with saving that life. And yet, someone who has this really considered religious belief system says, don't do that to me. Now, the law actually permits and actually says, without that adult, competent adult's permission, I can't intervene. And so the law now provides a way of navigating that situation that would arguably be counter to what Antigone faced. Well, and, and that what you're portraying is a conflict of, of role responsibilities on the part of the professional uh, and how to navigate that. So one way is to say, um, I, I as an individual feel more strongly about saving the life or respecting religious commitment than the other way around. So the, one could decide individually to do what you take to be the right thing. The, the law provides a way for you not to have to make so, that choice effectively. The law does, but arguably if I did that to that person without his or her consent, then I'm, it's not only my personal no, That's right, you're, so. you're, but, <laughs> well, but let me just say one more thing about that. So when, when people feel very, very strongly about their personal convictions, which seem to be at yeah. odds with what their roles require, their institution requires, the law requires, sometimes we call that civil disobedience. They're, they're standing up for what they take to be the more important value, maybe not in the, in the case we're discussing, but we, we do sometimes laud that. We, we don't view that as a failure. We, we see that as heroic, to, to maybe try to tie it back a bit to the Greek Before tragedies. Before you go on, Ruth, I want to give Ari an opportunity right. as a physician right. to respond to that, then I'll come back to you. Thank you. So, uh, so I've taken care of patients who were Jehovah's Witnesses as a hematologist, uh, and I've also sat in on hospital ethics committees where issues have arisen about Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, I'll start with the second, uh, and there the issue often is whether or not the person understood everything and whether or not the person felt external pressure from the community, from the religious community, to make a decision separate from what they would have chosen if they were isolated from the pressure of the community. So that's one set of issues. But I will tell you of an anecdote uh, with one patient in particular, because of course I felt exactly the same tension and responsibility and went through in enormous detail the, the, the real risks involved, and ultimately coming up with the fact that potentially the person would die if there were a situation in which they desperately needed a transfusion. And the, uh, the gentleman sat across from me and he had uh, a, a look of tranquility on his face. And he said to me, Doc, this is, let me want to say it exactly the way he said it. He said, I am a soldier in God's army and sometimes soldiers have to die. <laughs> and I think what he was saying to me is, you really don't understand my religious conviction. And so I'm going to give you a metaphor that even you will understand as to why I've made this decision and why this is my considered decision and why I want you to respect my decision. In that case, I would have, fortunately I didn't have to face the issue, in that case I would have really felt that it was my obligation to respect that decision. Go ahead, and then I would like to ask. No, no, go ahead. What I am really um, enjoying about the exchange about Jehovah's Witnesses is that I, I think it 
in addition to being great to have a concrete example, I think it illustrates um, some hopefulness with regard to the issue of polarization that we have been talking about for the whole of the conference. And that is there are arenas of life and medical ethics is one of them in which competing value structures, conflicting values, have come um, to be the main territory right, that we have to deal with all the time. That's what we do. There are conflicting value structures all the time in medicine and health and science. And we have been learning over decades how to navigate them. I'm not saying the answers are in or that it's always done easily. But it's not a scary place to be once you figure out right, the, the key dimensions, the key ingredients, one of which Barry just beautifully modeled, and that's respectful listening. And this came up a lot yesterday. Rachel was talking about this. So we have to learn to listen, and we have to listen to hear. Right? And sometimes people have uh, value structures or value commitments that are so different from our own that we uh, we, we can't hear, right? And that goes to the sort of thing that Uri was talking about and why we can't hear has a lot to do with some very complex evolutionary and neurobiological uh, processes that we have to figure out how to work with, not against. So there are ways to navigate polarized value conflicts, which are really what's, what's at stake in, in pretty much everything whatever the territory is. But it's, it's not easy, but it's doable. <coughs> it's absolutely doable. And the Jehovah's Witness case shows you right, how it can be done. Um, as you were talking, the question that came to my mind is a question that was just posed by somebody from the audience, and I'm really glad that they did. And by the way, we have a number of questions that are very interesting, and I will go through Great. them. Great. But the question here is, what happens when the religious conviction of a parent does not allow the doctor to interfere and save a child's life, which we're talking about a completely different set of values now, yeah. and or a completely different space. Yeah. This is so, so Barry. Uh, I, I think our colleagues probably best at that, <laughs> but uh, anyone. Uh, uh, we've been on ethics committees, I suspect yeah. all yeah, of we, us we have, have where this. in yeah. fact you, this, right. this this issue yeah. comes up and. In the, at least in the <laughs> United States, one can and often will choose to go to court uh, about this issue and to override the parent uh, if the child's life is at stake and the view is that there's an obligation. So just quickly to say that's fascinating as you're talking how the audience is anticipating a lot of these things already and the next thing that the next question has to do with the fact that can somebody, can a doctor in, your, in this particular case you, be sued by a relative yeah. uh -huh. and be taken so, to court for refusing to give this yeah. person an transfusion. So, so, so there are a lot of, so I, I was very careful in um, describing the case. I, I snuck up on you, I don't know if this is public ethics or private ethics, <laughs> in saying that it was an adult who was competent. And so we set up the case as the easiest case in a way, which is still a hard case. And having also treated patients like this and been on ethics committees with this and actually watching someone die in an intensive care unit who I could have saved with nurses wanting to transfuse anyway, stating that they wanted to override the patient's preferences after we had agreed, and doing the palliative care along with another physician as that person died rather than do my other job, I still think about that case some 25 years later. It's not easy. It's still, each time I talk about it, I know it was the right action but I'm left with this stuff. And that's part of really tough moral decision making. Now, we take the case of a child who can't make or have not articulated his or her own belief system. Do all of your children have the same religious beliefs as you? Do you have different beliefs than your parents? Do we know that that's exactly where you will land? Is it that important as a matter of life and death? And it's because a child has not yet articulated or learned or adopted those values, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we generally change the answer on that question. And we see it as our ethical obligation now to intervene. Could we get sued? Doctors always get sued, especially in the United States. With a, we, I would, you'd need a, lawyer's, the, a lawyer, law firm the size of this uh, screaming man's choir to help you out. 
but it's a consequence of, of working in that space. I, I, I want to maybe push us a little bit too about, let's use the Jehovah's Witness case, about what's, what's at issue, what's, what's, what are we disagreeing about? So it's about beliefs, about what happens in terms of eternal life. So there's still a value for life, right, on the part of the Jehovah's Witness, the parents of the child or for themselves. But it's a different understanding of, of how to value life in that particular context. So in a, in a way, it's a different kind of disagreement, right, than one about my ethics are different than yours, which, which gets us to a different place, whether we have shared values, which is an important question to ask about, and what we disagree about is what we believe happens after we die, which in some sense is about facts, we disagree about what happens. And that's a, a different kind of disagreement than one that's about core um, values that we don't share. And I want to make sure that we try to tease those apart. Okay. I want to get through a couple of other questions and then um, I'll come back to some of mine. Um, the first one is, to what extent does the constraints on medical care imposed by insurance companies challenge the Hippocratic Oath? Uh, it's, it's a huge problem. Uh, and if you have patients who need treatment, but there is no source of payment, uh, this puts the, the physician in, a, in often an untenable position. And it's why universal health care is the only uh, <laughs> potential response to the dilemma. Uh, we, it, 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 it's, uh, I think that's enough said. Yeah. Uh, just, just to recognize, uh, Greece has a different kind of well, fractured problem, <laughs> difficult health care situation right now. There isn't a country in the world, even a country with national health insurance, national health care, national health service, that is able to provide every patient with everything that could possibly benefit them medically. It's, it's just not no. tolerable. Okay. It would break the national bank. So tough choices have to be made everywhere and are being made everywhere. Right? The core question, the situation with health insurance is particularly pernicious because it's by and large profoundly unjust. Right? It doesn't have either fair processes or principled uh, uh, commitments behind who, who gets what and who is denied what. Right? Uh, what we have to hope for are health care systems, infrastructures, rules and policies where we allocate the resources we do have available fairly, not arbitrarily, and not based on ability to pay, but not with the situation in which everybody is entitled to everything. I'll give you an anecdote. Do we have anybody here from, from Colombia, from South America? Yep. Even? Yes. Right? Yep. So you would know well the, 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 the context in Colombia in which you can have an entitlement to health and a constitution that then turns its head with people using that constitutional right to sue for access to very expensive medical <coughs> care, right, which the courts then feel obligated to provide, right, and often at the expense of more uh, basic health care for more people. Right. So even when you have a constitutional structure that guarantees a right to health care, how that constitutional right is executed, who has access to higher legal representation to go to court to get that advanced cancer care when there are many people who are not receiving primary medical care, it's a struggle. So while I'm the last person in the world to defend health insurance companies in the context of who gets and who doesn't get health care, I just want to recognize that even in systems with universal health care and universal health coverage, sure. there are tough ethical decisions <clears throat> that need to be made corporately, right? No, I, I think these issues about fairness and how we allocate our health resources are, are important. And I think, again, not all insurance companies are created equal, and some um, put up barriers in certain ways that are inappropriate. They're just wrong. Um, and so the question is, how do we set up? No, I mean, 
you, you're paying for a product, right? So, so we have to start with a, b a basic minimum of health care for people. We're buying insurance for taking care of rare events. Certain things are covered and certain things aren't covered. There is a, insurance companies are companies. They have a fiduciary obligation to their shareholders and to deliver a product. What's inappropriate is the, bar the unnecessary barriers they put into place, uh, not enabling people to fairly access what to, that to which they're entitled. So again, it's, it's a huge issue, and um, the amount of time and energy that's wasted in many healthcare systems simply through a process that's grown increasingly cumbersome is not a fair process, and I think that's the uh, piece that's really worrisome. Um, any of the normal moral rules, if, if the insurance companies lie or they deceive, that's wrong, just as it would be in our private lives. So it's, but if they're fair and, and appropriate, then, then that's another story, so. I mean, I think to, to Barry's point, um, it, there's a basic question about whether healthcare ought to be bought and sold as other commodities are, um, and, and a universal. public good? I mean, yeah. you can, right, and you using, can raise using a, Exactly, yes. using and a company, a health insurance uh, approach answers that question in one particular way, but I think many of us sitting here would think it's maybe not the most appropriate. The other thing to say, which I think strikes people who don't come from the United States as maybe a particular aspect of the U.S. system, is that when we, t we talk about rights, we tend to focus on negative rights, liberties, protection from interference by the state. Uh, we have very few entitlement rights, as Ruth was, was suggesting when we talk about countries where there is an entitlement to health care. And so entitlements in the United States it, are, are things that we tend not to um, find politically appealing, and in fact, as we sit here, um, the legislature and Congress in the United States is debating, I think, exactly this point without calling it out as such. So, this is in the U.S. context, but it's also played itself out in the British election. One of the real polarizing yep. uh, issues in at least some societies, right? Whether to think of health care as an entitlement or whether to think of health care as is not an entitlement in the U.S., of course, that's a usually polarizing issue and one of the flagship uh, differences between people on the right and people on the left. Uh, President Obama used the language of health care as a right, wanted to instantiate a right to health care in the U.S. Yeah, not all that successfully, but that, yes. that, that was the language that he used. He used. People on, um, in opposition were railing against what was, came to be called Obamacare because they believed that that was not an appropriate uh, way to understand the role of government. So you peel it back further and it goes to what is the proper role of government in a society with regard to basic services. In the European context, the notion that the government should be involved in the delivery and guarantee of health care has been entrenched for many decades, many, many decades differently in different countries. It's less of a polarizing issue. That said, if in the last election, right, if you, in, in Britain, and again, I know we have people from the UK here, but uh, Theresa May's stepping back right, on the question of whether uh, what we think of as home health aid, uh, care services for people with progressive dementias and other disabilities, helped tank her election because she misread, right, where the bulk of the, uh, the electorate was in the UK, yet there, it is a polarizing issue there as well, just how deep and how well, uh, how far the government should go in moving towards privatizing, for example, some basic healthcare well, right. services. So this just stays, it questions. sort of sits in the body politic pretty much Thank everywhere. You. Uh, there are questions that are addressed to some of you individually, but I want to get away a little bit from um, the conversation being focused on, on bioethics and medicine, and not because it's not relevant, it's very relevant, but because I want to perhaps uh, try to address a couple of broader questions. And one of them is, are public ethics even relevant in today's society? Have we become victims of personal ethics and fears, for example, on issues related to security, borders, and immigration? And Jeff? I, I couldn't hear what you said, actually, sorry. So, are public ethics even relevant in today's society? Have we become victims of personal ethics and fears about 
security, borders and immigration. These are not necessarily personal fears or personal issues, but the question here is, have personal ethics superseded public ethics or the public good in a way? Should it be, reflect how should it be reflected in the, yeah, the public sphere? Um, I, I think we're at it, so the way I would access the answer to this question is around the disagreement about facts. We're very challenged at the moment about um, what, what counts as evidence. And so without agreement on facts, it's very hard to figure out what the answer ought to be in terms of applying one's values. And, and that, for me, feels like a very un, unmooring environment in which to try to answer the kinds of questions that you're, you're asking. And even when we were here over the last um, few days, it, when we broke into small groups and talked about how people thought about the, immigration, the migration and immigration problem, uh, in our group, there was a, a lot of question about what's, what's the correct way to understand what will happen in the future. And sort of without being able to predict, and of course part of the, the political goal seems to be to predict in order to advance your agenda. Uh, so uh, I'm not answering your question, but I'm, I'm suggesting that for us to get any traction on this, I think, requires us to get to a point where we have a, a stronger di agreement about facts. Okay, Jeremy. So the question about is this personal ethics or is it public ethics? I think it's a public ethics problem and I think, I'm not sure the nature of the question being asked because each of us is, is appropriately concerned about our safety, our security, our well-being, uh, living a full life, right? And, but the, the piece is how did that, does that translate into the specific problem at hand, in this case, uh, a border that's uh, bringing refugees? What, what are our other moral obligations as individuals to compassion, to fairness, to justice? So how we balance our own personal ethics helps us set up a frame about what do we do with the facts once we have them, and how do we articulate that both as my, my obligation, my personal obligation to help another human being, my personal obligation not to hurt another human being, those are all central to our moral belief systems. Mm -hmm. And then individually, how much can I do either to help or to harm a process publicly that can help populations of people who are similarly situated? So I, I don't, it's where the balance falls apart a bit, but get good to Ruth. So when I was doing that tripartite thing in the beginning, uh, I hesitated because I, I had a more complicated schema that I was going to lay out, and I didn't. So now I'm going to lay it out. Okay? Uh, Seatbelts. So here we go. Uh, public, right? The, the term public is contested because often the term public is tied up with polis, the sort of notion of the, of the state, right? You're a citizen. What are your civic duties? Questions, and we had much discussion about this over the past, the previous two days. When you get to problems like immigration, climate change, uh, water management, we can go down a whole long list, what we know are global challenges. Right? Public ethics, if we think of public in the context of public citizens, right? The, the question that was reviewed, do you think of yourself as a, a citizen of the world, a global citizen, or a citizen of a state? Uh, resolving and understanding our proper ethical obligations in the context of a problem like migration and immigration in the face of war and economic devastation and water insecurity and so on, uh, raises questions about in and out groups at a very fundamental level, right? Uh, do we want, how much, do we, should we be thinking about the public, right, as our co-citizens, our co-nationals, and how ought we to be thinking about people who are not our co-nationals and this is where I retreat to the language of universal human rights, that there's something, so if you've got your Hippocratic oath that kind of trumps your state obligate, your, your national laws about how a physician should conduct themselves, you might think about the um, commitments to universal human rights as a kind of uh, civic analog to the Hippocratic oath, something that in some respects maybe not necessarily always trumps, but at least is always out there as a side constraint on your um, obligations if you are, in this case, the prime minister of a country or a president of a country or the, or the national parliament and so on, in thinking about your allegiances and obligations to your citizens, right? So that's the kind of tension we have here. Um, on 
tempted to uh, think back in an evolutionary context. Go for it. Uh, because we <laughs> put a lot of focus on uh, <laughs> yeah. a very thin sliver of our existence on this planet. So uh, we used to say up until a couple of weeks ago, we've been around as a species for about 200,000 years now, maybe it's 300,000, maybe next week it'll be something different, but we've been around for a, a, quite a while and we are very successful. And the reason that most of the evolutionary biologists who uh, I speak to or read, uh, they say that that is because our brain and our ability to communicate allowed for cooperation. So we usually think of evolution as I, me wanting my genes to take over as much as possible on the individual level, so we have rooted in us a uh, desire and for competition in that way. Uh, but we also recognize, or we should recognize, or we should educate people to recognize that in fact our real success has been through cooperation. Yep. Now, if you also think historically, we've only been living at scale for 10,000 years out of those two or 300,000 years, because that only occurred with agri when we had the agricultural Agriculture. revolution. So before that, the groups that we had to contend with, to cooperate with, was probably something about 75 to 100 people. So we've been trying to, I think, desperately come up with ways to enlarge that. And you've heard a, a lot of the, the, the comments that have been made. Trying to expand that out further and further in recognition of our collective self-interest in dealing with issues like this collectively. And we've stumbled and failed and made progress, stumbled, failed, and made progress repeatedly. Uh, and I'm not minimizing the stresses on this, but I think that if you put it in this context, then we've been inventive enough to build out from a lot of smaller scale to larger scale in cooperation, but we clearly have a long way still to go. Can I, can I add? Go ahead. So, so just to augment what Barry just said, the, the question is whether we can be inventive enough, quickly enough, to save ourselves from ourselves, right? So it's this sort of notion of we're, we're too good at competing. Every time Homo sapiens have showed up over the course of evolutionary history, the rest of the species go away, right? So we outcompete. It's part of how we seem to have evolved. And we seem to be doing something similar. I mean, that's sort of your, your point, just to make it very concrete. And, and will we be able to figure out a way to coexist, cooperate before it, it's too late? I think not to be a downer here, but uh, that seems to be sort of the take home from your, your little trajectory there. Um, there is a question for you, which I would like you to consider, actually, because I think it's quite an important one. Um, is Dr. Faden suggesting that recognizing health as a right in the Constitution is wrong? No. No. I'm just saying, oh, absolutely not. Okay. Sorry, I don't want to be misinterpreted. What I'm saying is it doesn't solve questions of fairness and justice, because an unspecified right is terribly important and rights um, especially basic rights, and I would take it that a right to health and a right to health care, and they're not the same, right? So a right to health would entail a right to a healthy environment, it would entail a right to a sufficient amount of food and water and other things, not just health care. But a right to health and a right to health care, to me, are basic universal human rights that um, the way we've structured the world right now, the first responsibility for fulfillment falls on the nation state. That's deeply problematic because many nation states don't have the resources to do it. And many nation states have, uh, there's so much inequality and in resources between nations, right, that we have a problem in, in letting this sit with each nation. It disadvantages the citizens of some countries, advantages the citizens of others. But even in wealthy countries, right, where there is an enshrined right to health and health care, either in the in the actual amended constitution or through legislation, there still remain very difficult issues at how to specify that right. What exactly should you be entitled to? How ought we to figure out who should get what level of health care? How much are we going to spend for what kinds of things for what people? So the, my only message is 
that not that we, we should and don't have, we actually do as far as, and I think I can defend this fairly well if we have several more hours, we have a right to health care, we have a right to health. Exactly what that means, right? What specifically that entitles each of us to, that's hard, that's hard work. And that is also a very polarizing and contested space. Um, I want to read another question. Is there a trend to normalizing a morality in certain societies? And how can citizens respond to the absence of strong public ethics in the political system? And I want to take this to another level, actually. Um, I, I personally believe that even worse than polarization is what I consider the disease of re relativism. Everything is relative in our societies. You can't get a straight answer of whether or not something is right or wrong. The first response always, well, this is relative, and this is relative to this, and this is relative to that. So um, we've got a real problem here. If, if people believe that everything is relative and there is no objective truth, then we've got a serious problem. Can you combine these two questions together and try to get through them? I will start with uh, Jeff. So the, the people spend um, whole four, lives. four years of their <laughs> doctoral <laughs> training, write a dissertation, and you then their whole lives try, trying to puzzle this out. So um, you know, don't expect the definitive answer here. Uh, and it's a really important question. Uh, and, and the question is whether there are shared, first, values. The second, harder, is universal values. And when you ask the question about relativism, um, there, there's multiple layers in which that has meaning. So we can think about relativism in the way you phrase it across societies or cultures, which may not be the same as societies. We can also talk about relativism across time, historically. So we can point to many historical examples in our own experiences in societies where we would say they they were behaving unethically at the time. We often talk about slavery in the United States as the example of that. So how can we explain the fact that at some point in the history of the United States, it was deemed ethically acceptable for some people to own other people? And if that's a disagreement about ethics, then we have to ask what happened, yep. right? After 1840, 1845, as we left the Civil War, or was that a disagreement about something different, about facts? If we, if we can find things as factual disagreements, then we're in a, in a better place in terms of your question than if it's really a difference in values of ethics. And so it, it's a very important question. I happen to be, to answer your question directly, someone who believes that there are shared values, that there are universal principles that we adhere to and that do cross cut over societies and, and time, but that's an, an argument that needs to be made and defended. Uh, and, and I would ask, everybody to think, what would, what would the world be like with the alternative if everything was just rel relative? And what would we be subject to in terms of our behavior today by those who come after us 50 or 100 years from now? And I, I think we want to think very hard about what we do and what, why we do it in terms of that set of questions, looking backward and looking forward. Jeremy? So, uh, you know, I think there, this, is, this really is a super complex area and it plays, it depends on which examples you have in your head. Um, because there's, we, we hope that there would be some universal ethical truths, some basic set of principles or, that we would share that talk about respecting people, not hurting other people, <coughs> treating people fairly, things like that. We agree at that level and how it plays out in different problems is I think important. And part of it's a factual question. But another bit is, is how is that, how are we interpreting the world and uh, who gets to interpret and who gets to say that this is, this is right or this is wrong? So the slavery example, um, talk about uh, some, some nations or communities in which anyone except those most in power, whether they be men privileging their interests over women, whether it's slave owners, owners over, over uh, slaves. How, how does that come about? Is it a question of power? Is it a distorted view of the facts? I mean, because there are problems with it just assuming that because we have it sorted in this space, it necessarily works. And sometimes, 
What you most hope for is disagreement. And that moral disagreement leads to, and that even that polarization and discussion forcing the question of values can actually lead us to, to a better option. Just say yes or no. <laughs> well, no. We're not disagreeing yet. Here, here's a question for you, Stella. Yeah. Here's a question for you, Stella. Is we can continue on that, or we could go to other questions. No, no, we can continue this. You I want to continue with this help. one? Okay. So continuing with this one, um, uh, I want to invite everybody to imagine a world in which everything truly was at, was relative. Every ethical position was relative. Mm -hmm. And what that is sometimes referred to is a, a universal principle of tolerance. So everyone is um, to be tolerant of everybody else's deeply held convictions. Right? Tolerance is, of course, something as a virtue. We, we ought to, as a matter of character, moral character, we want to be tolerant of other people's beliefs and values and um, and commitments. If we have a principle of tolerance as our top principle, however, you end up with an ultimate uh, irreconcilable contradiction, yes. right? And that's where I want to invite you to think, right? So if, if there's a, if Stelios thinks one way and I think another way, right? And they're just very different, morally very different positions, right? And the tiebreaker is a principle of tolerance, okay? <laughs> then he has to tolerate my view, and I have to tolerate his view. If his view, which of course it is not, okay, is that it's all right for him to kill me, right? And I, as a matter of principle of tolerance, have to respect that. You see where I'm going here. Yep. That seems outrageous, right? Yeah, it won't work. But that sort of, then there, we've got some moral principle that we're agreeing to, which says you can't just arbitrarily take the life of another person, no matter how sincerely and deeply you have this conviction that it's the right thing to do. Let's make it less silly, right? Let's make it that, not stereos, some other person has the view that because I'm a woman, right, I ought not to be allowed to leave the house without a man accompanying me, a family member of some sort. Now, we know that is a belief that is held. And it's practiced. And practiced, right? Widely. Right, wildly now. I don't believe, and I can mount the argument, that I am ethically obligated as a principle of tolerance to respect that view. And the reason is that view is predicated on an assumption I can't take, which is that somehow I am of a lower moral status than someone of another gender. So there's another basic moral principle that comes out, right, that you can reject, but I don't think any morally serious society can, which is that we are all of us, all born human beings anyway, of equal moral status. So already we have two principles, right? One, you can't take the life of another uh, without profound justification. Another, that you must treat all other born human beings as your moral equal. So, and we can go on. And that's how you start to generate, right, a structure that doesn't resolve many, many, you know, sort of small, more specific areas of disagreement, but starts to build a common value structure that allows for dealing with problems of polarization and conflicting values and allows for civil discourse and so on. Thank you. Sorry. I, uh, I certainly resonate with uh, Ruth's construct, and I, I think it's really important. Uh, operationally, uh, I was really impressed uh, with uh, a book that was written by Alan Dershowitz called Rights from Wrongs, uh, in which he went through in a sort of systematic way looking for absolutes for figuring out what are the key values for society. And, systematically makes it clear that none of them are religious view or just the power of the state. And essentially, I think from an operational standpoint, he said that most of the things that we've agreed to as universals are things that have come from real life experience of really outrageous abuses and uh, atrocities. And that collectively, we have learned from those. And so 
putting in place protections against the things that we collectively have identified have been major, major problems for us as a, as a society, uh, is a not bad place to begin to look for some of the things that are not relative, but in fact require uh, a much firmer commitment to. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a few minutes left, and before we close, um, I wanted to come to something that we discussed in the morning uh, about polarization, since this was the main theme of the conference. And um, one of the things we talked about is um, that polarization involves power struggles in many cases. We tend to see it as a contested and negative fact, but a lot of times it's created from power struggles. So, for example, you have groups that have been denied certain rights for a very long time, that all of a sudden they are claiming those rights in the public space, in the public arena. We can talk about women, we can talk about minorities, we can talk about a lot of different uh, groups that are now claiming rights that did not exist for them before. And of course you have a power structure that thinks in a certain way and has put these constrictions into place. And that inevitably in the public arena leads into polarization by definition and into conflict. So I want, us, I want you to speak about this a little bit because uh, polarization is all, all not always a negative thing. Sometimes it rises uh, from a necessity. It cannot be denied. Um, Ruth, I know that. Yeah, please. So, uh, yes, I and mean, this is something we did talk a lot about, and I think a lot about. And Ferguson, uh, Antigone, and Ferguson, I think, brings that message, that sort of struggle home, if not in the um, in the words and the in, in the emotions. So the, uh, the thinking or the concept here is that uh, as groups, and this really is a group phenomenon, as groups who have experienced uh, exploitation, domination, um, uh, exclusion over time, uh, begin to um, it, sort of they've had enough, right? and it boils over and they begin as a group. The group begins to uh, demand recognition and equal moral status in the political arena and in the cultural arena. Uh, at some level, and, and it's human nature, the groups that have had the more powerful and privileged positions begin to experience a certain level of threat. It's threatening, it's, it's disruptive of the order. And there's a, um, and you know, sociologists and others who have studied this phenomenon recognize that what happens is a, 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 a longing for the good old days, right? When society was calm and quiet and there wasn't polarization and life was good. And translation, they long for the days in which there was no uh, plurality. Yeah, was there was no disagreement because they, the conversation was controlled, the values were controlled, the rights, the power, and the opportunities were controlled among um, a restricted group, right? Uh, when the groups that have been excluded start to emerge and express their right to be treated equally and to have their fair share of opportunities and power, this dynamic emerges, society is polarized, but in fact, from a long view of moral progress, as you point out, Stelios, at the end, it's painful, it's difficult, it's dislocating. Uh, there's anger, there's uh, warring camps, there are echo chambers, there are lots of things going on that are not good, but maybe that's an inevitable process, right? Maybe yes. there's no way to get to the point where things are more fair and people are treated more respectfully than through this dislocating experience. So we have to be mindful that polarization, if that's the term we're giving for, for societal dislocation, is not always a, a bad thing. It can be a period of disruption that takes us, indeed, 
uh, to a better place. And we can fill this in with lots yeah, of Yeah, before examples. you go on, I, yeah. I just wanted to mention, I'm glad you, you brought Ferguson up, because when I was there at the performance, it was very striking to me that a white member of the audience stood up and said, could we go back to how we yes, were sir. about 30, 20 the years girl, ago? Yes. And the police lieutenant who spoke during the performance yesterday stood up and said, honey, 20, 30 years ago, wouldn't be in the same space, wouldn't be interacting, we would not be talking to each other. So no, we cannot go back to what it was before, and that's the truth of the situation. Exactly. Yeah, so that's a great Jeremy. example as well. And so it's often captured in the phrase you hear today about speaking truth to power. And that, that speaking truth on the part of the group or the individual that needs to speak up and articulate a concern that unsettles the quiet, right? It makes it noisy, it's messy. Um, one other example in a completely different realm, it's just a hazard of what I know about, um, is, is the issue of early on, if you remember, in the AIDS epidemic, when there were absolutely no treatments available uh, to treat then AIDS because there was not even a test available to test for the virus. And uh, largely in Europe and the United States where the epidemic's face first appeared, it was happening in Africa, but because there was no healthcare system, people didn't see it. It was happening in, in some other groups as well. Identified uh, gay men, largely, noticed that they were dying. Now, on the one hand, a new drug became available because drug companies were working to find and develop new therapies. We have very good systems in place throughout the world to slowly and deliberately approve drugs so that they can be used in human beings. And that process often takes years, five, 10, 15 years from the time you develop the product until you know that it's safe and effective. And for good reason, we don't want people taking drugs that are not safe and effective. Well, if you were diagnosed with AIDS circa 1982, 83, you were certain to die within a year. 15 years so that the public could have safe and effective treatments wasn't what you wanted to hear. So AIDS activism led to this idea that silence equals death. That was the slogan of the groups. If you didn't speak up, if you didn't protest, if you didn't say, we want access to that experimental therapy now, we don't care if it doesn't work. We don't care if, it's, if, if it hurts us or kills us sooner because we are dead. And so through an intense set of lobbying efforts in Europe and the US, drug agencies changed their approval processes to speed them up. And so rather than be protected from research, people had access to it. And that now resonates with people of, it's, it was a disruptive approach with other diseases, cancer, any other, any other disease followed in that track of saying that system which protected the public in many ways, protected the interests of pharmaceutical companies in other ways, led to harms and has now been changed. And we now have new ways of thinking about speeding up research when people are desperately ill. So I just want to say it's not just a political construct, it happens in many sectors of our lives. That, that was certainly political, yeah. as, as, as well as health and, and uh, right, combating disease in a particular population. I, I, I would, this really interesting example, and I would say 1982, 3, 4, is, is different from 2017, 18, forward in, in a number of ways. Marching in the streets is still something that people can do, and lobbying their representatives, wherever they may be, but the public square is, is much more accessible now. And so online communities are doing exactly what you said around very particular right, disease areas. And yep. so among the really interesting things that's happening, disrupting the status quo, to maybe use just a few words to describe it, is that there are many, many more ways for voices to be heard and people are taking advantage. This is a very positive thing, I think. My, my personal experience related to this is I wrote a, an online column for CNN.com for, for four years, um, every other week. Fox uh, News it, now? It, yeah, no, not anymore. <laughs> um, but, but it was early days of, of blogs, it was before Twitter. And I got so much uh, feedback, most of it negative, most of it really sort of hate email, but it was dirty, messy, it, it disruptive in a way that I found actually very satisfying. It, it had impact in a way that 
um, most of the things that I speak for myself, I do as an academic, don't always feel as having such immediate um, connection to, to people outside of the communities in which we work and live. And so I, I think it's a really important and good thing, right, that we're able to find new outlets for sharing our views, trying to make change, good, you know, good, bad, and different about what's happening in the halls of power. So I, I think we're actually headed to a much better place in that regard. Barry, you have the last word. Oh. <laughs> Make it a big one. Uh, I, I, I would just reinforce what was said, and, and that is that uh, if you, because I had the discussion with the ex-commissioner just the other day and, uh, of the FDA in the United States, and the FDA has changed. The FDA has now incorporated the voices of uh, patients in a very comprehensive way to avoid a, another episode like this. So I, I'd say this is a very optimistic uh, thing to end on, that not only did the ACT UP an initiative yes. have an immediate impact on gaining drugs for that particular community, but it also had an impact on the system, and the system maybe not willingly at first, but the system understood that this was a very, very important thing to do, and so it changed the system and minimized the likelihood of other people having to go through that same process, and I think it strengthened it. So I think that surely many of the things that have been talked about are huge problems, uh, but I think that there's a lot of resilience in our systems, and I think the listening part is, of course, the way it all starts. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to the audience for your questions.